Precious one, welcome to Time with Archbishop Charles. I'm 40 years in full-time pastoral ministry and a miracle ministry this year. And along my journey, there are people I've come across and people we've related with. And for the next generation, I think it's important to show you where we are coming from. And so in trying to do that, I'm running this documentary series I've titled, Who Do Men Say That I Am? And in this series, one of the people I'm going to be talking to today is a very anointed man of God. He recently received the um, Most Influential Religious Leader Award in the Central Region. Um, I'm talking to no less a person than Bishop Isaac Buedu. Bishop Isaac Buedu, welcome. Thank you. Um, if somebody doesn't know Bishop Isaac Buedu, can you, in brief, tell us who Bishop Buedu is? Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Bishop Isaac Buedu, the head pastor of Life Cathedral, Grace House, Cape Coast. I've been in ministry for about getting closer to 30 years. I'm married with three kids, and I'm one of your sons who have been following for the past 30 years. I've been following your ministry. Along the line, I worked a little with you until the Lord asked me to start something. So in a nutshell, this Bishop Isaac Buedu, head pastor. Wow. Good, 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 good. So at what point did you come into contact with my ministry? According to my parents, I was two years when we got to Tamale. And so all my education and everything was in Tamale. And along the line, you know, my parents were in this uh, Cherubin and Saravin church. So along the line, I met a friend uh, called Emmanuel. Now he's Dr. Saboro. And he told me a lot about the church. I think by then he was there. And he was trying to convert me into Christianity. He felt that <laughs> service or that ministry was in mind. So he spoke to me about the gospel and I received Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior. And so he led me to the place there. And by the grace of God, I came there. Eventually, all my parents started fellowshipping. And we had a very nice time. I, I was just an ordinary member until eventually I felt I had this gifting of music. And so I happened to be one of the musicians in the church. So I grew through that was a trumpeter, could play the drums, the keyboard, and all those things. Eventually I became the praise and worship leader. And then I remember one day we went for a crusade at Kofuidia. And you normally like, whenever you are preaching, you normally like people touching the keyboard. So as I was touching the keyboard, you came from the pulpit and then laid your hand on my forehead. And you said, I've been called into the fivefold ministry. At that time, I didn't even understand what you meant, but I just <laughs> said, okay. So after that, I think a whole lot started happening. The relationship became very closer. And you started the Bible school. And I happened to be part of the second badge. And one of the things that really impacted my life was that I wasn't really ready to go to the school, but you said you would sponsor me. So I went through the Bible school without paying a dime. I went through the Bible school based on your sponsorship. And at that time, it was just one year. So I think 1993, 94, yeah. by God's grace, I graduated. And then we worked for some time till this level. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And... Uh, your, your, your ministry in Cape Coast is exploding. Um, I've been there a, a number of times. Yes. You know, when the Lord led me to the place, you know, I've, I've followed you closely. Uh, just that I'm a little bit far, but I follow very closely. And one of the reasons is I really didn't want to get familiar. Because sometimes when you get so familiar, it's difficult to learn some few things. And so I've been far watching and studying and uh, maybe the book your book that i don't have maybe it's the book you want to write today or you are yet to publish <laughs> i have bought almost everything but one of the books that really impacted my life is a power in prayer 
-hmm. something like that. Oh, I, impressed. Yes. Yeah. If I show you the first copy, it's very, I've read it and read it and read it. And there is some, something that came upon me, and that's the spirit of prayer. And so we got into prayer. I learned some few things from you going around the town, praying. The time we started ministry there, we were told that every church in Cape Coast, when you get to some level, you have to come down. And there were evidence to show. And there were a lot of churches that were not making any impact at all. But with some of these strategies, I got, I just followed and I kept listening to you. Once a while, we'll come for pastor's meeting and you're doing a whole lot of teachings. So based on some of these experiences and some of the things I learned, I got into serious prayer. And through the prayers and some few spiritual exercises, we're able to get to that level. It, it, it's not been very easy, but the Lord has been very uh, gracious. And one of the things that I, I don't know anybody in Cape Coast who doesn't know my relation with you. There is no place you will call me and I wouldn't mention Archbishop Charles Ajina, sorry, and tell them your impact in my life. You uh, even have a hall yes. in your church building named after me. Yes, we yeah. call it Bishop Ajina Sari Conference Hall. Oh, okay. Yes, I really didn't want that contact to be broken. I've seen the effects and the impact over the years, there have been a, a, a lot of people who have tried in a way to sort of disconnect me. And some of them have been people who were sons before. But all the time I tell them what this man has done or the impact he's made in my life, I think I would be very ungrateful if I should disconnect from him. And my whole life, I think I would like to remain loyal because of the impact. I didn't even know I was a minister. I, I, in fact, I didn't know anything. Came from a background, very poor background. And I never even dreamt I could get to this level. And so through your teachings and some of these things I've learned from you, have gotten me to this place. And with this alone. You are talking about the this place, but you have not described that this place. <laughs> now, <laughs> when you were pastoring, and then at a the point, you had to go and build on this hill. Yes. And then now, that, that building has become the largest. Of the, you know, tell us, you, you are being very modest with uh, <laughs> what the Lord has done with you, but I think that it's good people know a bit about what the Lord has done. Yes, with you came to Cape Coast for a program. And then during the program, I said, somebody told me about you, that you're around, your father is around. So I came around, and then we met. And then you asked me some few questions, and I told you we're going to build. We bought a land, and we want to put up a building. And so you said you would like to come to the place there. In fact, it's one of the things that really touched my life, because I didn't come to ask you. You opted you want to come and pray on the land. And when you got to the land, the first word you said was, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And I remember that oil you took, lifted it up, and poured it on that land. Then you also made statement like, will build this in, in record time. That was one of the words you said. And then you prayed for me and left. And by God's grace, some few things went on that surprised me, especially in the building of Grace House, which has become the largest single auditorium in Cape Coast. We've hosted a whole lot of even national programs at the place there. We'll be putting up buildings. Some few people come around and come and drop some things without my notice. Sometimes iron rods, sometimes cement. And sometimes you don't even know who brought it. And sometimes the iron rods, the number we use, you come the following day, and they say, look, that's come back. So the, it, it was within three years, because some of the people were saying it would take us about 20 years to build such an auditorium. But with some of the words you said, and the prayer you offered to God, I personally believe it's one of the things that gave us that speed within three years to get to that level. I was telling somebody recently that when it comes to building God's work, if we are told to account for it, the truth of the matter is we can't really account for it because like you're saying, <laughs> you'll be dead by the time you get to the site. Somebody has brought iron rods. Yeah. 
if they go through your books, you didn't take money to go and buy that. Yeah. So it will not be in your books. So if they bring a valuer to value the property there, and they take your books, they will see that they don't match. And I keep telling people, it's just, normally what we build is not through the offerings of the people. Thank God for what the people give. Yeah. But it's just like the five loaves of bread and the two pieces of fish that they put in the hands of Jesus. When we receive those offerings and we put it in the hands of Jesus, suddenly he multiplies it. And before you see, things are done. And we ourselves, it surprises us. Because there are times you, you see what God has done and you know that, Charlie, this one is not you. Yeah. I'm glad and I thank God for what he's been able to do in your life. Well, you, you've known me for these years. And uh, if you are to advise some young men and women coming and you want to say, okay, I want to use some points in Archbishop Ajinasari's life, what are the things you would say? The first one is your marriage life. Yes. Very, very touching. And like, as I said, some of us are from afar and we keep watching. And to be very frank with you, maybe I feel if maybe not because of you, if it's not because of what we are learning from you, maybe by now it will have affected our marriages. But then it's like if you have a father who is still with the wife, they've been very consistent, and you can't be different. Elephant don't give birth to cats. Mm -hmm. So let's just follow it like that. <laughs> so we keep moving. So I think at least we have somebody in front of us to learn from. So the first one I would say is your marriage. You, you meet anybody and they'll tell you something about Archbishop Ajinasari's marriage. And then your children, very decent, very disciplined. We read a lot. It's not easy to have uh, so decent and disciplined children who are also following your footsteps. All of them are married and very, very decent. And so some of these things are example uh, to us. For me, that's the first one, your marriage, even before the ministry. Yes, because I realized that marriage uh, to you, and you talk a lot about your marriage, and I believe it has been one of the foundations. And so we also don't joke with our marriages, and it has really, really helped all of us. So to me, that's the first one. Maybe when I get into ministry, apart from everything, your prayer life. I personally have been impacted in that area. I remember the first time we met uh, during the Bible school. I don't know whether this time we still do it, but those times, when we meet, the first day is for prayer. I remember the first time we met for prayer, it was about 12 hours. And I was like, what? We prayed 20, 30 minutes, and for 12 hours nonstop, we're praying. And some of these things have really impacted and affected us. The, the next one, I believe, is your consistency in ministry. And I also personally believe it's one of the things that have really impacted my life. You've been very, very consistent. I remember when we went to Cape Coast. You see this pastor, he's today is going here, tomorrow is going here. But what we see, you are very consistent in ministry. So I think with this three, your marriage life, your prayer life, and consistency in ministry. Because all these years, you've still been in ministry, and you've not deviated. And this is one of the few things that have impacted our life still dates. Amen. Bishop Dr. Isaac. Oh, the doctor hasn't no, come. Yes. Oh, okay, so I'm prophesying. Amen. <laughs> Bishop Isaac Buedu, you've been a blessing. Thank we you. appreciate what God has done with your life. Um, the history of Cape Coast Christianity cannot be written without you. Thank you. What you've done there is a very impressive, very impactful. The chiefs and traditional rulers all speak well of you. The political leaders all speak well of you. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Thank God thank bless you. you. Bishop Professor Lugutera. Yes, Papa. Uh, in brief, can yes. you tell us who Bishop Professor Lugutera is? Um, by the grace of God, um, uh, Bishop uh, Professor Albert Lugutera is a, a child of God and uh, secondly, the child of the Archbishop, 
Charles Ajin Asari, and uh, I'm a bishop of the King's Christian Ministry, and I'm also a professor of statistics and the Pro Vice Chancellor of the CK Tedham University for Technology and Applied Sciences, former UDS wow. in Abrongo campus. Wow. Chale, yes, your credentials are gracious. So. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we thank God for His grace. His grace. <laughs> Amen. Yes, Amen. I've known you for so many years. Yes, Dad. Um, at what time did you um, get to know me, get to know Wed Miracle? Yeah. I got to know Word Miracle in 1987. Okay. At that time, I was a student. Okay. Uh, when you came to have your crusade, I was in school, so I was not there. Okay. But I wrote my O-level in 1987. Okay. And so after the O-level, I think it was in June, early June, when I came home, okay. uh, church had started. Okay. And my senior brother and uh, my cousin, who had got me born again, uh, my senior brother is Reverend Andrews Lubitera. And then my cousin is uh, Reverend William Amegache. Okay. So they had uh, joined the Word Miracle Assembly at that time. Okay. And so naturally, they asked me to follow in church. <laughs> okay. And I had been born again, and they had been praying f with me to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Yes. And for about a year, uh, I was not having that evidence. So I followed them to church on that Sunday, and as soon as I set foot inside a church auditorium, I just started speaking in tongues. Wow. Uh, and, 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 and that for me was a sign. Okay. And so since then, I stayed in the Word Miracle, and then uh, uh, I was a young man, so we used to often come home okay. when you were staying at uh, Vitim. Okay. Uh, those days in a house without lights, without light, uh, water, etc. We used to come around to help. And uh, through those help, we also took time to also p watch how you conducted yourself in the home. Okay. So we learned a lot of lessons okay. and got a lot of inspiration. Okay. And uh, I want to say that from not just from what you thought or what you teach us in church, but from close range, just even watching how you conduct yourself at home and everything. I'm somebody who thinks a lot. So I learned so many lessons and your, your commitment to work, your hard work, and it's one of the secrets for my hard work as well. You learn it, mm -hmm. and you, you, you pick some of those things uh, consciously or unconsciously, and then gradually, yes. Yeah, so that's how I've got to know my papa, and I've been happy. I'm happy since, because I remember in those days, I, when I went to sixth form in Achimota School, and uh, we were active at the SU, and uh, everybody is talking about his father, his spiritual father, and people are mentioning some of the big names in Ghana. And I, I mentioned, I said, mine is uh, Brother Charles. And they say, who is that one? I said, oh, he's a powerful man in Tamale. <laughs> and I'm saying this in Accra, and the people cannot really relate with <laughs> what it is. Uh, but today, I don't need to <laughs> give any long description. It's just the, the archbishop. Okay. And then everybody knows who we are talking about. So we are glad. We are glad, and it's been such an inspiration, such an honor, Amen. and such a, a blessing mm. to know you as a father. Amen. And not Amen. just to know, but to have you as a father. Amen. Amen. So can you talk about how you got into ministry? And yes, um, I think that from the beginning of the Red Miracle Assembly, all of us in church in those early days were passionate. We were taught to be passionate for God, His work and the kingdom of God. So for me, it was about serving God, not necessarily ministry as we call it today. We're just passionate in serving God. I remember each time we came home from school during the holidays, uh, they would gather all of us as students and we go out on evangelism on all the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are some areas in Tamale I can confidently say there's no house I have not entered. There's no shop I have not entered. And we're just passionate serving God. So it started with a passion to serve God. And uh, along the line, um, it became so strong. And I really didn't think of it about ministry till after sixth form. Okay. After sixth form, in those days, I used to pray a couple of hours because you used to give us uh, targets okay. as home cell leaders. Uh, number of hours you should pray in a day, 
a number of chapters you should read in, the, <laughs> in a day. I remember we started with five, we got to ten. Okay. Uh, five book of Psalms, one Proverbs, okay. New Testament, I mean all those combinations. Mm -hmm. So we were committed to it. And after the sixth form, the passion became strong that look, you just had to do more for God. And I remember at that point, it became so strong that I nearly didn't go to the university. In fact, I did not apply to go to the university. I did it. My father tried. I said, no, I was going to serve God. My brother, who is a pastor, tried. I said, no, I was going to serve God. Everybody tried. I said, no, I was going to serve God. And then gradually, it was my senior brother who picked the form and applied for me. And then uh, we started, I got admission reluctantly, went to the University of Ghana. And then um, in the first years, and I do recall that even in the beginning of the study, we, a church, we used to have what we call the Bible Training Institute, okay. which now became the uh, Perez Bible School. So we were taught a lot of things in terms of ministry and things. But for me getting into ministry itself, I would say somewhere when I was about going to the university, that's when it was strong. And I thought that I had to give my all to serving God. And I mean, events uh, took off and then I finished the university, got my national service to Tamale. I remember that one too. I was supposed to do my national service at the University of Ghana because I was one of the top people in statistics at that time. And I was so excited to do my national service there. And when the postings came, lo and behold, I was posted to Tamale, Tamale and I was posted to uh, Tamasco. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't understand it. And I remember I came to my papa, I came to ask him, I said, Papa, I mean, uh, they have posted me to this place. I am not sure this, that, I'm supposed to be in this place. And I was expecting Papa to say, I mean, to pray some of the powerful <laughs> prayers that would change <laughs> the things for me. And the only thing I heard from my papa was just make sure that by the time you finish, your national service, you would have caused revival in the education range. Mm. And I was like, this is not what I expected. <laughs> and then that was the birth of the uh, Word Miracle Church in the education range at that time. And that's, I think, the launching path for ministry. I was still a brother at that time, too, but we started having revivals, planting church, and doing all kinds of things. Mm. Yeah, so. Wow. So, why did you not just do ministry but decided to go into academia i will say i will say that the seed has been in my heart because before i joined word miracle i probably would have been an ordinary person but the teachings uh, give us focus it give us a sense of life, a sense of leaving an impact in the world. And so anything we wanted to do, we wanted to do it to the best of our ability. I remember after my university, I applied to do the masters immediately. At that time, they were not doing statistics, so I couldn't get the admission. They wrote back and told me that they had stopped it. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I had stopped the plan to do further studies, and I went into ministry. So that's where we went into church planting, etc. But later on, I was teaching in school, and one of the requirements, I remember one of the meetings we went and we were talking, and somebody was like, some of you, because you cannot do your master's. And I was like, so you mean some people really think I cannot do my master's? <laughs> and I went into prayer, and I was talking, and God said, well, it's time <laughs> to show whether you can do it or not. Okay. And then I, st so I picked the form, applied, and that very year I got at BC. And guess what? I finished before the person who made the comments. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway. I'm glad I did because one, it was a requirement at my job. And after I finished the master's, I remember uh, I had to also do the PhD. And then when I started, in fact, at a certain time, it was just too tough because combining ministry, combining family, and then combining the studies, and I was also working at the same time, was very difficult. I remember one time I called you, and I was like, Papa, uh, this PhD thing, uh, I think I've done enough. Minist the demands of ministry are just too many. I have to give up this PhD and just concentrate on PhD. 
And uh, I remember your comment was like, Albert, you can't give up on this PED. You must finish it. The body of Christ needs it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? I have to do ministry. He said, no, the body of Christ needs it. You will not understand it today. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I didn't understand it actually that day. Uh, but here is my papa who had told me something, and I said, okay, I'll do it. And I told myself, if I have to get this thing done, then I better get it done quickly. Mm -hmm. So that also motivated me to work extra hard. Mm -hmm. And so I finished my PhD in record time as well. And then uh, afterwards, I can confidently say that I understand today the, what you said when you say the body of Christ needs it. Because if I hadn't done that, I probably wouldn't have been the pro vice chancellor today. Mm -hmm. And I have seen it open doors. It has given me opportunities in places where I can speak the gospel mm -hmm. uh, to any manner of persons. I go for meetings, and sometimes I go for meetings, I don't even introduce myself. And then uh, when it's time for prayer, somebody says, oh, but the bishop is here. <laughs> and this is a meeting of professors, or this is a meeting of uh, administrators or something. And mm -hmm. it's like, uh, I even went to the regional uh, administration with the regional ministers and co, and it was like, oh, the bishop is here. And I was like, I didn't know they knew I was a bishop anyway. <laughs> and, but it gives you the opportunity to speak to them, uh, to tell them the gospel, etc. cetera. And uh, it, it, it's been great. And not to talk about the impact we have made on a lot of the young ones, particularly. Um, previously, there were not too many of those examples. Now it's better. But I have had countless number of young Christians today who come and tell me that I want to be like you. I want to do the ministry, but I still want to work. I want to do the ministry, and I still want to work. And we have many of such people, and I've tried to challenge them to go as high as they can go. Because like you always tell us, um, our influence in society is more than just tongues. And like the Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, I have seen folly mm -hmm. in high places, mm -hmm. that servants are riding horses and mm -hmm. princes mm -hmm. are, are walking. walking. If the princes don't do that which is right, mm -hmm. we will continue to walk mm -hmm. while the servants will continue to ride. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the things that, one of the great impacts you have done in my life. And uh, one of the things that I'm also trying to speak to the young ones to, uh, to take it up seriously. And, Sometimes, I remember an occasion in which a, a group of Christians were having a challenge on one of our campuses. And uh, they needed a place to use for, uh, how will I call it, fellowship. And when they went, they were not giving them the permission to use it. So they had gone into fasting and prayer. They had fasted for about one week. Wow. Waiting for God to turn the heart of the person to give them the permission to use. and. Uh, just about a few days to their program, uh, the permission was still not granted. And then the president called me. I said, Prof, this is the problem. I said, OK, who did you see? Who is this? Who is that? When he finished, he said, give me a minute. I took my phone. I called the president and asked, yes, my people say they want to use this place mm -hmm. for fellowship. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes. Uh, and why was the problem? He said, oh, we are going to use it for something. And when they use it, it will take time to arrange it. And therefore, we cannot give it to them. And I said, oh. But you and me know that you can finish all of these things in one day, isn't it? He say yes. So what prevents them? He say, oh, tell them to come and take the key. Wow. So in less than five <laughs> minutes, I called them back and said, go back, and then they will, they will help you solve your problem. So the and body said, of Christ is not everything. How did you do it? <laughs> I said, you see, five minutes call can do certain things that one hour, prayer, no, one, no, one, no. Week one week of prayer fasting and prayer do. cannot do. Mm -hmm. That's why mm -hmm. the youth of today must rise up to the highest positions mm -hmm. possible so they can influence mm. the world with the gospel. Wow. wow. You, you've known me. Yes, Papa. So if they say you should sum up or you should talk about Archbishop Ajinasari, what would you say? I would say that uh, Archbishop Charles Ajinasari is a man who undoubtedly loves God, very passionate about God. Uh, he's a very hard worker, committed in whatever he does, and he loves to help people a lot. I can say he prays a lot, 
a lot of prayer <laughs> and a lot of Bible study. <laughs> a lot of it. I remember that this, uh, there was a certain time in my life where every day was an all night. Okay. Because we used to come to your house okay. at the uh, Agric Agric Junction Agric, there, yeah. and every day we are praying right. all night. You go for church service after Tuesday service, then you go for all night. Mm -hmm. Then the next morning, and all those. So we are trying to challenge the young people. So as for prayer and the study of the word, and uh, I remember your books, your mini books mm -hmm. as well, you used to read. And we used to come, and after prayer, we'll have all these. Those is the video decks okay. were not common. Okay. So you have a video deck and you have all these powerful preachers and things. And then when we finish praying around four o'clock, it's too early to go. So sometimes you watch the video, get inspiration, then around six o'clock that we are leaving <laughs> to go about our normal uh, duty. So I think it's a, I can also say that you study the word. Uh, you are deep in the prayer. You love God. You give a lot. You give a lot. I can say that you give a lot. And for me, there are preachers, and there are preachers. Uh, there are many good ones, no doubt. But there are also many uh, who do not represent the body of Christ very well. I can say without doubt that the Archbishop Charles Ajit Asari is an example at home, at true diligence in work, and also in ministry. You don't just talk the talk. You live the talk. And I think that one of the things I remember you telling us always is that the power and the authority is not just in seeing the words, but living it. So whatever you tell us, I am confident that you have lived it, you have seen it. And uh, I remember the scripture, taste and see. So, um, that's, that's the few things I can see off my head about okay. Archbishop Chasset Nassar. And for young men coming, what do you want to say to them that if they follow in my life will be a blessing to them? Right. Um, to all the young men and women, we are living in a day and time where uh, society makes us believe that this world is all about amassing the best of qualifications academically, um, working hard and earning so much money, living in a duplex and uh, enjoying life as they call it. But all of that is worth, worthless without God. My first challenge to everyone is that put God first. All the others will fall into places. I'm an example of how God, by his grace, can raise nobody to somebody. I never thought I would become a professor. I never thought I would become a pro vice chancellor. I never thought I would even become a bishop. But just serving God and giving him the best of your life, God gradually took me to where I am. Like the Bible tells us in Matthew 6, uh, verse 33, say we should seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. All other things will be added unto us. The time we spend with God in prayer, in sacrifice, in giving, in all the things that we do, they are never time wasted. They are time invested. And God has a way of multiplying all of that to you in a very short time. I joined academy, academia not too long. And for many people, they think my rise to professorship has been very, very fast. Indeed, it has been very fast because I've got a God who has been behind me. Even though it has been fast, it has not been through short shortcuts. Mm -hmm. I can confidently say that if we check my academic profile, you will see that I have done much more than many people, many professors would have probably done in their lifetime. Supervised so many PhDs, so many master's degrees, so many publications, and I managed to do all of this still doing ministry still being a family man, etc., because the grace of God works in every sphere of life if you allow it to work. The grace of God is not only for prayer and the study of the word. The grace of God works in every sphere of life. So no matter your calling, no matter your area of life, what you need to do is to attract that grace by being committed to God. And if you want a good example of grace at work, I can tell you, find it in my papa here, 
the Archbishop Charles Ajinasari. Please stay tuned and listen to everything he tells you. And I'm sure you'll become like I am and even better than I am. God bless you. Amen. Bishop Dr. Lugutera. Yes, Papa. Thank you for Always coming. your son. Bless you. Thank you, Papa. Amen.